Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our live broadcast tonight. Let's uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Just ask that you would bless tonight's study for your glory. We give it to you, Lord, and pray your spirit would really be our teacher, Lord, and give us grace to understand, apply, and live out the truths we learned tonight. We thank you, Lord, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, it's good to have you joining us tonight. Um, the word, I think, has gotten out that we're going to start a new book tonight, the book of Revelation. Uh, I tried to stretch out Jude as long as I could, but uh, there's only so much you can do with 25 verses. So here we are. And um, again, I want to stress that we are studying the book of Revelation, not Revelations. <laughs> I hear people say sometimes the book of Revelations. No, it's the book of Revelation, singular. Now, one of the keys to understanding this book is found in the opening statement the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of St. John the Divine, as some Bibles introduce it. The word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, the word we get our English word apocalypse from. Of course, the English word apocalypse, apocalypse has come to mean the chaos and catastrophe associated, associated with the final destruction of mankind. However, the Greek, Greek verb apocalypse simply means to uncover, to reveal, or to make manifest. Uh, think of it like the unveiling of a statue in a park somewhere. You know, the statue was covered with uh, a sheet, and um, you have causing, you know, kind of limited perception of what's under that sheet until the moment of the unveiling when the sheet is pulled away. And uh, then the statue has now been revealed for all to clearly see. In this book, the Holy Spirit is, in a sense, pulling back the curtain and gives us the privilege of seeing the glorified Christ in heaven. And, you know, the fulfillment of his sovereign purposes on the earth in the establishment of his kingdom. Everything that Jesus Christ came to earth to accomplish, he went to the cross to to purchase our redemption. But also the Father promised him a kingdom someday. And now, of course, in Revelation, we see the fulfillment of that promise as Jesus comes at one point uh, and establishes that kingdom on the earth. Now, when we talk about, in this book, the Holy Spirit kind of pulls the curtain back and gives us uh, an a incredible uh, view of, of the glorified Christ in heaven and so on. Um, this is contrary to what many teach, that the book is beyond understanding. It's beyond understanding, many say, that the imagery is so far out that it virtually is impossible for anyone to comprehend what's going on. And therefore, this book is best left alone because it is essentially a sealed book. But guys, that concept is in direct conflict with the very title of the book, The Unveiling of Jesus Christ, the Revelation, the Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. I mean, far from being a sealed book that God never intended anyone to understand, something that was hidden from us, this book is something that God is opening to our understanding. He's pulling away the curtain, if you will so that we can finally see Jesus in all of his glory like never before. In fact, this is the fulfillment of a prophecy which God gave to the prophet Daniel. You remember how that God gave to Daniel a lot of visions and uh, revelations of the coming future events. In fact, you know, events yet future. And at one point, uh, Daniel was overwhelmed. And he says in Daniel 12, verses 8 and 9, he said, although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, speaking to an angel that was standing there, what shall be the end of these things? And the angel said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And then we come to the book of Revelation, the book of unveiling or unsealing, where God opens to our understanding what Daniel desperately wanted to understand but couldn't because those things were hidden from his sight in those days. But now 
God is revealing to us. And again, guys, for the most part, a lot of churches won't, I don't know, teach the book. A lot of Christians won't read the book because they believe it's a sealed book. When in fact, God wanted us to read it and understand this book so much that he actually promised a special blessing uh, to the reader, to anyone who would read here and keep the things written in it, chapter 1, verse 3 tells us. And I, I personally believe that part of that blessing, God is blessing those who will read this book. Part of that blessing is that in reading and studying this book, as we seek to understand and unveil all the symbolism and the imagery, listen, it will take you into every other book in the Bible. The golden rule of hermeneutics, which is the study of Bible interpretation, the science actually of Bible interpretation, is that scripture is always best interpreted by scripture. So if you really want to understand the Old Testament, study the New Testament. I give you Acts chapter 7, where things were revealed in that chapter that illuminate uh, some of the things that the Old Testament didn't really uh, zero in on, all right? So it, whenever possible, try to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And that is the reason, guys, this book is so difficult uh, for many to understand. It's because they don't have a real command of the Old Testament Scriptures. A lot of Christians won't even read the Old Testament anymore uh, or at all because they feel like, you know, it is... Um, uh, something that's outdated. It's the Older Testament or the Outdated Testament. And really, that's not true. It's the First Testament. Uh, in, uh, in, then, of course, after co comes the New Testament or the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So it's not a book that should be, uh, you know, ignored or neglected. Uh, but a lot of Christians don't read the Old Testament. Therefore, they're very ignorant with regard to what the Old Testament teaches and that's why when they come to the book of Revelation, they can't really understand it. Because the Old Testament, the book of Revelation points people back to the Old Testament. In fact, scholars have pointed out that there are over 400 direct references uh, in Revelation to the Old Testament. Now, I've heard some teachers say as many as 800 direct references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. That means, listen now, that means that the book of Revelation is the key the key to uh, understanding, the key that unlocks our understanding of the uh, Bible uh, in a way that we can't even really fully grasp, all right? Uh, it's really a key that unlocks our understanding of the Bible like no other book in the Bible. You know, Augustine said, in the Old Testament, you have the New Testament concealed, and in the New Testament, you have the Old Testament revealed. Jesus said, the volume of the book is written of me. Now, he said that in Psalm 40, verse 7. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews picked it up and requoted it in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Um, and you know what? The book of Revelation is the lens through which the Old Testament comes into focus. That's what I'm talking about. Um, where we can really see Jesus uh, in every type, shadow, and symbol. Uh, I want you to understand that Jesus himself said this. Remember on the uh, afternoon of his resurrection, as he joined himself to a couple of disciples that were, were making their way to uh, Emmaus, the village of Emmaus. And he got into an Old Testament Bible study with them. Of course, it was the only uh, testament at that time. But um, it says in Luke 24, verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. The volume of the book is written of me. And Jesus led these two disciples on an Old Testament, our Old Testament, Bible study, pointing out uh, how Jesus is in every type, shadow, picture, and prophecy. Uh, incredible. I wish I would have been there for that Bible study. Now, guys... I have to uh, throw this out to you so you understand this, just so you have a working knowledge of how other people or how various people approach the book of Revelation. Now, wait, hang on one second. I forgot to turn off the air conditioner, and it's bothering me. One second. Uh, 
All right. I apologize. I don't know if you could hear that like I could, but it was bothering me. All right. So there are four classic views or interpretations of the book of Revelation. And um, there's probably offshoots, but I'm going to stick with just the four main interpretations. And I throw these out only because you should have a working knowledge of how others approach this book. All right. We're not all the same in how we approach it. The first is the preterist view. The preterist view. Preterist means past or fulfilled. Uh, the preterist approach views Revelation not as a future predictive prophecy, but as an historical record of the events that took place uh, in the first century. Now, the preterist view ignores the book's own proclamation of itself that it is a prophecy, uh, but they don't see it that way. Uh, the preterist view requires that uh, that that um, we see the words of Jesus when he talked about his second coming, uh, that we see that prophecy that he gave us fulfilled uh, in the first century, primarily with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. So Revelation, they claim, has already been fulfilled in the first century, again, primarily through the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. And uh, But that's... Jesus didn't come back uh, in 70 AD, all right? So that wasn't fulfilled. And also, if you study the horrific events in Revelation chapter 6 through 19, you can't really find anything in the first century destruction of Jerusalem in the temple that fit that those cataclysmic uh, judgments and things. So uh, I reject the preterist view. Number two, the second main view is the historical view. And guys, the historical view finds in the book of Revelation a record of church history from the apostolic period to the present day. And those who hold this view often resort in allegorizing the text in order for them to find, quote unquote, the various historical events that they believe are hidden in the book of Revelation. And uh, they think everything from the fall of Rome to the barbarians, the rise of the Roman Catholic Church, the advent of Islam, even the French Revolution are all hidden in the book of Revelation, and we just need to dig them out, the historical view. Like the preterist approach, though, the historical view ignores Revelation's own claim, again, to be a prophecy. Well, then the third view is the idealist view, and really the idealist approach sees um, in Revelation, simply an allegory, the whole thing is an allegory, uh, of, of the timeless struggle between good and evil. That's all it is, just a portrayal of the timeless struggle between good and evil played out in every age. And um, according to this view, Revelation is neither an historical record or a predictive prophecy. One author uh, says this about this view. He said, and I quote, like the first two views, uh, not only does the idealist view ignore Revelation's claims to be a prophecy, but it also, if carried to its logical conclusion, severs Revelation from any connection with, the, with actual historical events. Thus, the book is reduced to a collection of myths designed to convey spiritual truth. Well, then the fourth main view is the futurist view or the prophetic view. And this view sees the book of Revelation, and I'm thinking primarily of chapters 4 through 22, as a, a prediction of events and people to come, people like the Antichrist, false prophet, and so on, uh, that were future in John's day. Obviously, John was the one who wrote these things down. So in John's day, yes, it was definitely future, but guys, there's still future in to our day, okay, the events of Revelation chapters 4 through 22, even though... We are getting very close. But those who hold to one of the first three views of Revelation are frequently forced to resort to allegorizing or heavy spiritualizing the text to support their interpretations. Let me just stop and say this. If you're embracing a theological system that forces you to have to spiritualize large portions of Scripture to make it fit your theology, uh, you have the wrong theology. Because the rule is interpret the Bible as literally as possible, whenever possible, unless it's obviously allegorical. What do I mean? 
Jesus said, I am the door. Doesn't mean he was made of wood. All right. The psalmist said that, you know, that he wanted to take refuge under the shadow of God's wings. God's not Big Bird. Okay. These are obvious allegories. So if it's an obvious allegory, fine. Uh, the problem is when people take what is meant to be literal and allegorize it like the Jehovah's Witnesses do with uh, Revelation 7, when they take the 144,000, which is clearly uh, not to be taken allegorically, but literally, uh, as the Holy Spirit even names the 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, uh, but the JWs, they spiritualize that. They're not the only ones and claim that, no, 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 we're actually the 144,000. We'll get to that when we get to chapter 7. But you understand what I mean. If you're embracing a system of theology that forces you to allegorize large portions of Scripture, stay away from that. I mean, guys, if you allegorize the Scriptures enough, you can read anything into them. So let's keep it as literal as possible, as much as possible. Well, the futurist approach, uh, in contrast to the other three, I think does full justice to Revelation's claim to be a prophecy. And if you haven't already figured it out, I personally hold to the fourth view that chapters 4 through 22 are prophetic and yet future to the day in which we are living. Now, I think it's pretty well accepted among evangelical scholars, I don't know about liberals, but among evangelical scholars, that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. John wrote Revelation around A.D. 95. A.D. 95, during the reign of the Roman Emperor Titus Flav Flavius Domitian. Emperor Domitian had demanded that he be worshipped as Lord and God, and that anyone, including and especially Christians, who refused to obey his edict to worship him as Lord and God, would suffer severe persecution and or death. Tradition says that it was Domitian who sentenced John to be boiled in oil for, for proclaiming Jesus as God's Savior and Lord. But upon having John thrown into a pot of boiling oil, the oil had no effect on him, which tells us, which tells us that until God is through with us, we are indestructible. God wasn't through with John yet, as we're going to see. So Domitian then ordered John to be sent to the Isle of Patmos off the coast of Asia Minor, which is nothing more than a barren rock, basically, that juts out of the Aegean Sea which also served as a Roman penal colony where prisoners were basically sent there to just die, okay? It was there that John received the greatest revelation in the Bible, the revelation that completed the New Testament and has changed countless lives over the centuries, the book of Revelation. Now, after Domitian died in AD 96, John was freed and allowed to return to Ephesus where he lived out the remainder of his life and ministry and was eventually buried there. The outlook, excuse me, the outline of the book of Revelation is given to us by the Lord Jesus himself in chapter 1, verse 19, where he commanded John, and I'm quoting now, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And so, guys, the outline of the book is simply three main divisions. First of all, write the things which you have seen. That would be the vision uh, in chapter 1 of Jesus Christ. Then write the things that are. That would be the things of the church in chapters 2 and 3. Remember now, uh, John lived in the church age. The church age had started about 60 years earlier. Uh, we're still in the church age, by the way. Uh, the church age started at Pentecost, will, will culminate uh, at the rapture. So write the things which are, at that time, of course, uh, and even in our day, was the day, the, uh, the things that, uh, that are the church things, things that pertain to the church. And then finally, write the things which will take place after this. The Greek is metatauta, and actually is translated after these things. That's an important Greek phrase. We'll look at it. Uh, in detail in a few weeks to come. So hang in there with that. Metatauta, a uh, very important phrase. We'll see how it fits into what John is uh, writing to us. All right, guys, uh, let's just jump in. So Revelation 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, 
which God gave him to show his servants things which, which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. All right, let's unpack that, okay? It says, God the Father gave this revelation to Jesus, who in turn gave it to an angel to deliver to John, who in turn shared it with the seven churches of Asia Minor, and eventually it made its way to the entire church as the last book of the Bible, all right? Now, critics have jumped on the statement, things which must shortly take place. They jump on it by saying John didn't know what he was talking about, okay? He thought this was going to happen shortly, but look, it's been 2,000 years and these events still haven't happened, so John was wrong. Unless, of course, you hold to the preterist view, then you believe you're right. In fact, they use this verse to, um, to say, look, we were right. These things have already happened. They happened quickly from the time John gave them because, you know, uh, by 70 AD, all the events of Revelation had taken place, and uh, the book is now uh, a finished book, and that's how they see it, but I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that for a lot of reasons, but look, let me just stay with this verse, all right? The word shortly, th things that must shortly take place. The word shortly is the Greek word takas, not tacos, takas, uh, which can mean uh, in a brief time rapidly or quickly. In fact, it's the word we get our English word tachometer from. A tachometer is something that measures RPMs, revolutions per minute. And if we're talking about a car, how many times the engine's crankshaft makes one full rotation in a minute, right? Um, the idea, guys, is that John is not saying that these things were going to happen shortly in the sense of chronology, like, you know, maybe a few months or a couple of years. No. Uh, he's talking about these events uh, being rapidly fired off. Or in other words, they happen quickly or rapidly once they are set in motion, as the idea. The idea is that these things written in this book, once they start, are going to be so destructive, so cataclysmic, and so horrific that, listen, they can't be prolonged or dragged out because it would mean the destruction of every living thing on the planet. This is something that Jesus affirmed in Matthew 24, verse 22, when he's talking about this very period of time. He says, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved or would remain. All right. A very incredibly, wow, uh, an incredible period of time with regard to uh, judgments and uh, and. Um, a death and destruction. I mean, for example, in Revelation 6, we are introduced to what some have called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And um, in a short period of time, they wipe out one quarter of the earth's population. One quarter of the earth's population um, in not that great a period of time. Guys, that would be the equivalent to the combined populations of South Africa, the United States, Canada, and all of Europe. All these people are wiped out as war and other cataclysmic judgments um, break out on the earth. Very devastating period of time. And that's why the events detailed in this book uh, must come to pass rapidly once the first event is tripped I mean, think of a, uh, the first domino in a whole string or a whole line of dominoes. You've seen some of these uh, domino, I guess, contests where they line up all these dominoes. And the first one is tripped, and boy, in rapid succession, the others fall right away. I mean, just boom, 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 boom. And that's kind of what John is describing here. Once the, the first event is tripped, and we're going to see that first event is really, uh, we know it is the signing uh, of the peace treaty, the Antichrist with Israel. But uh, I think that the coming of the Antichrist, as uh, Revelation 6 describes it, is really probably the first domino that's tripped. And when the Antichrist rises to power, it's going to set off a series of events, again, like those dominoes falling in succession that are going to happen pretty rapidly. That's kind of the idea. 
All right, verse 1 again, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to a servant, John, verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. John is telling us that he was an eyewitness of the things that he is writing to us about. And we'll talk about that more uh, later in the study. But John is saying, look, I'm an eyewitness. This wasn't hearsay. I didn't receive this information from anyone else. I was an eyewitness to these events taking place. How could that be, you say? John lived in the first century. These events haven't taken place yet. We're in 2020. Uh, we're going to see how God transported John through time to the actual time that these events began to take place. Verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. I want you to notice this, all right? Uh, John said, blessed is he, singular, probably talking about a pastor or an elder, who reads, the implication is out loud publicly, to those, plural, I think the congregation is in view, who hear the words of this prophecy. Let me just stop there. What am I saying? John is telling us that blessed is any pastor who reads the words of this prophecy to his congregation, and all those who hear and keep the words written in it are going to be blessed. Now, I bring this out because not only does John tell us this, but again, there are a lot of pastors, yeah, they won't even read this book to their congregations, let alone teach it. I've heard them say it's just too controversial. It makes people too uncomfortable. Nobody can understand it anyways. And so we just stay away from it because we don't want to uh, upset people. We don't want to drive them away from the church. We're all about unity and bringing people in. And doctrine sometimes divides, especially a book like Revelation. So we just don't read it. We don't teach it. We just leave it alone. Well, that goes against the blessing that God said would come upon that church whose pastor reads the words of this prophecy to his congregation and they all take it to heart and do whatever they can do to, to keep whatever God has said, they're going to be blessed. But that's just the day we're living in. When apostasy has taken hold in the church, the people are turning away from the faith and some are turning away from large portions of the Bible because they don't want to make people uncomfortable. The goal is to be a man pleaser and to bring people in to build a big church and, of course, uh, a prosperous church and so on. Um, that is not what we are commanded in Scripture to do as pastors. We are to teach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God. And if we make some enemies along the way, so be it. But we are not to teach the Word of God uh, in a way that would be purposely objectionable, uh, offensive. We're not. It's not about offending people. It's about declaring God's truth, which will offend some because many are not living according to what God has said, and therefore they don't want to hear it. And we'll leave the church, and a lot of pastors just don't want that to happen, so they just kind of keep things nice and, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, just very sweet, pleasant, uh, non-confrontational, and so on. Uh, that's not the kind of pastor we need in this day and age. We are coming to the end. Jesus is coming quickly, and we need to be faithful to teach the whole counsel of God. Now listen, the Apostle Paul had sent seven letters to seven churches, Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and Thessalonica. And now John sent one letter slash book to seven different churches. This is a special message from Jesus to his church. And I want you to keep in mind that the churches in Asia Minor at this time were facing incredible persecution from Domitian, Emperor Domitian. He was brutal with the church and how he persecuted the people of God. And because of it, it was very important that they be in a right relationship with God. In other words, living in close fellowship with the Lord and with one another. If they were going to make it through this persecution. You know, that's what God says in his word, don't forsake the fellowship of the saints. We need each other. 
We need to encourage each other, pray for one another, and so on, especially in times of great tribulation and persecution. It's interesting that we are living at a time when we also need to be in a right relationship with God. This is not a time for Christians to be wishy-washy, carnal, worldly, uh, giving God lip service. This is a time when we must be all in for the Lord. We must be really walking in holiness and commitment, all right? Uh, very important. And also, it's a time we must get together and be with each other so we can encourage each other. Interestingly, we can't do that, can we? Because Satan has developed this COVID-19 COVID virus, and uh, our leaders have uh, forced us to stay uh, home and uh, not be able to interact with each other. And so uh, Satan feels he's won a great victory, dividing the church. He can conquer it more easily. But whatever the devil means for evil, God uses for good. And God has not left us without resources. We have the ability through various uh, avenues and portals to get together. We can Zoom with each other. Uh, you can FaceTime. Uh, you can Skype. Uh, you can call somebody on the phone. My point is, it's very important that we don't just roll over and accept what the devil is doing, that we go the extra mile in trying to stay connected. We need each other. A lot of Christians even are feeling the stress of this forced, uh, you know, quarantine. And I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were telling me it's just starting to get to them. It's hard to just do nothing day in and day out uh, and so on. Uh, but being with each other, calling each other, Zooming each, with each other helps to uh, build us up and uh, help gives us the strength to make it through. So I encourage you to do that uh, because we need each other now more than ever. Now, the churches that John wrote to are uh, pictured as seven, excuse me, as seven separate lampstands seven separate lampstands, each being a light in a dark world or a dark place. Let me put it that way. Uh, you guys, the darker the day, um, well, the greater the light must shine. And uh, you can read Philippians 2, verse 15, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, where we are admonished to be lights in this dark world, um, that God has placed us in dark places. Um, you know, our neighborhood or our town or our state, okay? And in these dark places, we must shine. We, we must um, serve the Lord uh, and do the works of God. And that would include acts of kindness and all to, to others, uh, unbeliever, unbelievers and strangers, because that's how we let our light shine to them. But um, very important that we understand. John was writing to seven churches who lived uh, in, a, uh, in a place where it was a lot of darkness and um, a lot of persecution. And so um, we are admonished to be like lampstands, lights burning in a dark place. Unfortunately, situations existed in at least five of these churches um, that required correction before their lights could... Uh, really shine as brightly as God uh, wanted them. And so uh, very important, and this is one of the reasons why this book is so important, especially chapters 2 and 3 for the church, because it will correct things that maybe we're in you know, violation of, uh, things that we're not doing that the Lord has commanded us to do, things that are uh, putting our light out or greatly diminishing it, and so we need to listen to what Jesus had to say to each of these churches, take it to heart, apply it to our own lives, our own church, and uh, see how we can let our light shine even brighter. Well, John concludes his short introduction with the admonition, the time is near. The time is near. The word time, kairos, in the Greek refers to a period of time in particular. A period of time in particular. And here... It's referring to the time of the end, or as we often call it, the end times. In theology, uh, the word for that is eschatology. Eschatology is a fancy word that simply means the study of last things or the study of the end times. And this is what this book is all about. It's teaching us about what's coming 
at the end of human history, right before Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom, and we enter into a new age uh, and a new kingdom, all right? But Revelation chapter 22, verse 10, uh, John said that um, the angel said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, John, for the time is at hand. So, you know, this, this time, the time is near. Um, the time is at hand, same idea. And, uh, well, how near? The apostles didn't really know. Uh, they didn't know how near uh, the events of these things would transpire. But uh, the knowledge that Jesus could come back at any time uh, kept them looking every day for Jesus' return and, listen, living holy lives. I will have you turn to 1 John 3. I know you know this. Let's read it again together. First John 3. Remember what we just said? How that looking for the Lord's return will keep us vigilant, will keep us, um, you know, always serving him and not wanting to get entangled with the cares of this life. Uh, which means it will help us to live a holy life. Uh, John says this in 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. He said, Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it ha has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We're not glorified yet. We still have these er earthly bodies. But we know that when he, Jesus, is revealed, he's talking about the rapture, when Jesus comes at the rapture and is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is at that time. We're going to be glorified. We're going to be made like him. He's got a glorified body someday and probably soon. We will have a glorified body also when he comes for us. Um, in verse 3, and everyone who has this hope, the hope of Jesus coming for his church, the rapture at any time. Listen, anyone, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is Pure. So I believe what John is saying is that if you are living with the idea that the rapture, and, and, and let me just say this, all right, there are people that believe that the rapture will happen uh, at the midpoint of the tribulation, right after the midpoint, that's the pre-wrath position, or even at the end of the tribulation. Those people who believe any one of those three with regard to the rapture are not looking for Jesus Christ. They are looking for the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist has to come first before the rapture if it's going to take place at the midpoint, right after the midpoint, or at the end of the tribulation period. To me, that doesn't seem like good, solid Bible interpretation when we are told that we are to keep our eyes on the looking for the coming of Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist, okay? The pre-trib position, I am a pre-tribulational believer. I believe that the rapture will happen before the tribulation period begins. It begins with the Antichrist signing the peace treaty with Israel, as we talked about. Um, but I believe that uh, as we're always looking for the Lord's coming, uh, vigilantly watching for his return, well, it's going to keep us from getting entangled with the cares of this life. Um, I'm not going to be looking for the coming of the Antichrist. I'm going to be looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus even said himself, an evil servant says, his, my master delays his coming. We believe the rapture is imminent, which means it can happen at any time. There's nothing to look for before the rapture could happen. If there was, we wouldn't be looking for Jesus' return. We'd be looking for whatever sign it was that it had to happen first before Jesus raptured his church. The rapture, I believe, is imminent. And anyone who says, my master delays his coming, uh, because I'm looking for some other event or, or the coming of the Antichrist, well, Jesus said, uh, that's an evil servant. An evil servant. One pastor even went as far as to say this, and I quote, you show me a church that doesn't teach the rapture of the church, and I'll show you a church that is involved in carnality and immorality, unquote. Well, that might be overstating it, but I understand where he's coming from. Turn to Mark chapter 13. Mark 13. Uh, 
And I'm going to pick it up in verse 32. Because Jesus was very much, um, well, he constantly told his disciples to be watching for his return. Always he did. Because he, he knew it would lead to a holy life and, uh, and all. But in Mark 13, starting with verse 32, listen to what the Lord Jesus said, okay? He said, but of that day and hour, no one knows the, the exact day and hour of his coming. Nobody knows. Uh, not even the angels of heaven and heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Well, that last one kind of sends shivers up your spine. But Jesus Christ was was uh, commanding us to watch for his return. Now, folks, I've said it before. Let me say it again. There's a difference between waiting for the Lord's return and then watching for his return. What do I mean? If I invite you over uh, to, for dinner and you say, yeah, I'm going to be around. I'll be there around six. I got some things at work. I'm not sure uh, if I can get there exactly. I, I'm, I'll be there around six, six-ish. Okay. And, um, and, 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 and I get busy. Doing stuff, setting the table, finishing cooking what I'm cooking, and you suddenly come and catch me off guard. Yeah, I was waiting for your coming, but you still caught me off guard. If I'm watching for your coming, everything's ready. I'm standing by the door, uh, the window, looking for your car to pull up in the driveway. You're not going to catch me uh, off guard. I'm I'm watching for your coming, and that's what the Lord is is saying here. There are many Christians who are waiting for the Lord's coming but not as many who are watching. How do I watch for the Lord's coming? I have to study prophecy and know the signs he has given uh, to us uh, that have to happen before Jesus' second coming. I, I, I just said there are no events that have to take place before the rapture. That's true. But I know the rapture will precede the second coming by at least seven years, by at least seven years. So if I study the signs of his second coming and I see them happening and they're happening pretty regularly now, well, I know that, you know, his, the, his coming for his, the church, the rapture, is that much nearer. I like what my pastor used to say. Of course, it doesn't apply anymore because it's crazy. But he used to say when we were, uh, my wife and I were at the store the other day and, um, and uh, they had Christmas stuff out. This was now before Thanksgiving. Okay, and then when Christmas is about now in September, so it's not even, but he said, you know, uh, we were walking through the store and I saw all these Christmas decorations and I said, oh, Thanksgiving must be getting real close. And she said, well, what do you mean? Well, if I see all the signs of Christmas, I know Thanksgiving precedes Christmas. Uh, if the signs are, of Christmas are here, it means that uh, Thanksgiving is getting real close. If the signs of Jesus' second coming are happening all around us. It means the rapture is getting very close indeed. Now, I know, I know that uh, those there are many who would say, you know, you Christians have been talking about Jesus' return for 2,000 years. Where is he? Where is he? Well, that's a good question, but don't forget what Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 8. He said, Beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Look, I know that a couple of thousand years is a long time for us. For God, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's a it's a blink of an eye, uh, or as He likened it, like a couple of days. Uh, when you're talking about uh, eternity, uh, I don't care how many years you're talking about on this earth. It's nothing compared to eternity, a drop in the bucket. Okay, so yeah. The Lord has been promising Jesus coming for 2,000 years now, all right? But thank God for that, because I don't know about you, but I've only been saved 40 years. I know it seems like a long time, but not when you're talking about eternity. Um, 
But if Jesus had come back in, 19, in the 1960s, like a lot of people thought he would, or actually they thought he was coming back during the World War II period. Uh, they even thought Hitler was the Antichrist and Mussolini was the false prophet. Or we're going home. This is it. This is what the Bible talks about. If the Lord would have come back, you know, in the, in the 1940s, um, well, we weren't even born yet, but obviously we wouldn't be saved. We wouldn't enjoy heaven forever. So the longer the Lord waits before he comes, the more people get saved. And we rejoice in that. So just kind of take that to heart. All right, verse 4 says, John, he's writing now, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. To the seven churches which are in Asia. Uh, Asia does not refer to Korea or um, Japan or China. It's a reference to Asia Minor or modern day Turkey is what the uh, is what it's talking about. The number seven is prominent throughout the Bible. If you know, if you study the Bible, you know that. All right. But especially in the book of Revelation, where it appears 54 times, 54 times. Let me say this. The number seven in Scripture signifies completeness, not holiness. I've heard Christians say, yeah, seven means holy. No, it doesn't. It means complete, complete. When God wants to communicate that something is complete or perfect, and guys, not necessarily perfect in goodness, all right, he uses the number seven. In Revelation 12, verse 3, we read, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, that's talking about Satan, having seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems or crowns on his head seven signifies in this context a being that is completely evil there's no goodness in the devil at all the bible says that in god there is uh, there is light only light no darkness at all where it is in the devil there is only darkness no light at all all right he is the perfection of evil is the idea all right now, here's the question. Why did Jesus choose these seven churches to write this book to? And even then singled out uh, each of them in chapters 2 and 3 to dictate special individual letters to? I mean, certainly there were much larger and more important churches than these uh, that Jesus could have singled out to write uh, this book to. I mean, like the church. Uh, in Rome, Church of Rome, the uh, uh, church at Antioch, even the church at Jerusalem. These were large and well-known, important churches. So why did the Lord pick these seven churches sprinkled around uh, the western part of Asia Minor, modern Turkey? Uh, why did he do that? Because, listen, these seven represent the church symbolically throughout the entire history of the church age, from the apostolic period to the present day. Don't misunderstand. They were literal historical churches. I'm not saying that they, are, they were just allegorical. They were real, literal churches. But Jesus picked them out because, and we'll see this very clearly when we study chapters 2 and 3, he chose these seven because in a spiritual way, because of what was going on uh, in these churches, and uh, the places where they were planted, um, symbolically, there were lessons that he wanted to use them to teach us. All right. Again, we'll look at those. Uh, very, it'll be very clear when we study chapters two and three. But not only did uh, these seven represent seven periods of church history from the apostolic period to the present day, but uh, they also speak to individual believers. All right. To individual believers living during any part of the church age, dealing with the various problems that we uh, wrestle with, uh, pitfalls we encounter as Christians. These seven letters uh, also, in a spiritual way, uh, relate to every Christian who has ever lived in any age of the church age. Okay, we'll see that again as we study chapters 2 and 3. All right, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace. And guys, it is always in that order in the New Testament 
In other words, you'll never experience the peace of God until you first experience the grace of God. And I'm thinking primarily of the grace of God in salvation, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not the result of our good works, lest any should boast. So you'll never know the peace of God. That peace that Paul talked about in Philippians 4, that surpasses human understanding, that gives you calmness and quietness of spirit in the midst of some of the most horrendous situations. You'll never know the peace of God until you first experience the grace of God in salvation. But look, grace is even bigger than that. Uh, grace means the undeserved favor of God and, uh, and all the strength we need, the strength we need to live the Christian life on a daily basis, all right? And again, peace is the resulting calm that enables the believer to face persecution, sorrow, and even death itself. He goes on in verse 4, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who was, excuse me, who, uh, from him who is, and who was, and who is to come. This phrase, again, from him who was, and is, and who is, and uh, who, uh, <laughs> wow, um, from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, uh, simply is a way of saying that, or presenting God, uh, is a um, uh, is, uh, being in all three dimensions of time, past, present, and future, all at once, all at once. That's just real. We know that God's eternal. God is eternal. He is called the great I am in Scripture. Uh, very important that that uh, implies that God is eternal. He's not the great I was or the great I will be. He is the great I am. In other words, God is always in the eternal present tense. I think it was Hal Lindsey years ago who gave the, gave the illustration that I've always, I've always loved it and I have shared it with you uh, in the past. But um, Lindsey said that uh, we look at time uh, the, way you would be, the way you would look at a parade from street level. Uh, where you are, you see uh, the parade coming by you um, at any given moment, but you only see really what's in front of you, all right? God sees that parade, that parade being human history from start to finish. He sees that time like uh, a person in a, heli in a helicopter looking down on that parade. In that helicopter, that person up above sees the, the beginning, the middle, and the end of that parade happening all at once. This is how God uh, is. He is, uh, he is uh, living uh, in the eternal present tense. Uh, from he is at the beginning of creation. He is at the midpoint where the cross was. He even is at the end of time. Uh, he sees it all happening uh, in front of him. And that's why he knows the end from the beginning. That's why he said, I'm going to place in my word prophecy. 27% of the Bible is prophecy. Guys, I'm going to tell you things before they happen because I, I know the future. I, I, it, it's all in front of me. I'm in the eternal present tense. And therefore, I'm going to tell you things which are going to come to pass in the future, that when they come to pass, you will know that I am God outside of time and uh, that this is my word. All right. And I think we'll see that even more clearly as we study the book of Revelation as we progress. As we talked about God never having a beginning and never having an end, I like Psalm 90, verse 2, written by Moses, by the way. Before the mountains were ever brought forth, or ever you were, you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so before the creation itself, God existed. He exists right now. And uh, after this world is destroyed and God recreates it, makes a new heavens and a new earth, he will still be there. God is eternal. Okay. Again, Revelation chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, guys, sounds a little strange, but I really think this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Um, seven being the number of perfection and completeness. We read in Revelation chapter three, verse one. And to the angel of the church of Sard in Sardis write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God. And I think the idea is the sevenfold spirit of God. 
And we'll talk about that more when we get to chapter 3. But I believe that this is talking about the Holy Spirit, since John goes on to say in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. Now, because of that, John, in my mind, has just mentioned now the entire Trinity. All right. Verse 4, grace and peace uh, from him who is, who was, and who is to come, God the Father, and from the seven spirits, or the sevenfold spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, who is before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. Uh, he's got the whole Trinity in mind there. All right. I'm going to need to stop there. We're out of time. Uh, we will pick it up in verse 5. So please come back next time. We'll pick it up in verse 5. A lot more to look at in this first chapter. Um, but then as we come into chapters 2 and 3, you're going to see those two chapters, for us who are Christians, um, are the ones that matter the most. I know that a lot of Christians want to get on to all the judgments and all the cataclysmic uh, events that take place because uh, those are pretty incredible to, to study. But really, the chapters that really relate to us the most, chapters 1 to 3, and primarily is the church, chapters 2 and 3. So uh, hang in there, and uh, we will get to chapter 2 pretty quick. But uh, next week, we'll pick it up again in chapter 1, verse 5. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this book. We thank you, Lord, for telling us things that were going to happen in the future, things that we believe are coming very soon, that we might, Lord, be on guard, that we might be vigilant, that we might be watching for Jesus' return, that we not be entangled in the cares of this life. And we just pray, Lord, that now more than ever, you would give us grace to be on fire for you, not to be wishy-washy, uh, carnal Christians with one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom. Lord, work in us, bring revival to your church in these last days, Lord. Burn up the chaff of carnality, complacency, and uh, worldliness. Replace it with a fire for your word, a passion for souls, a desire to be a light in this dark world for your glory. Lord, we just pray that you would bless the studies in this incredible book going forward. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great evening.